very word of God to your life. And so uh, turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll be just in a couple of verses today. Uh, we'll, we'll be slowing down. Uh, as you'll see, chapter 6 has kind of a smorgasbord of different topics, and so I decided not to press on into the next topic, but just to linger in the first couple of verses to begin with. Now, how many chapters are there again in uh, 1 Timothy? Six. What chapter are we starting? Okay, so we're on the home stretch. We've got about a month left in this series. And uh, again, on the 25th of June, I believe it is, we'll be watching a movie about the persecuted church called The Insanity of God. And then from there on, we will uh, go ahead and proceed right into 2 Timothy. So that's that's the roadmap. And uh, just to get ourselves reacquainted so we uh, don't lose the forest for the trees, uh, the book of First Timothy could be split up into the problem, the priority, and the practice. The problem in chapter 1, anybody remember what the problem there in Ephesus was? There's uh, false teachers in them that are hills. Uh, so uh, because of the false teachers, uh, Paul instructed young Timothy, you've got to stick around there in Ephesus and stop them from their false teaching. So that's the problem. The priority in response to that we saw in chapter 2, and that's prayerfully preaching the gospel. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple, and that's what our response, that's what our priority here at Three Lakes is as well and then from chapter three all the way to the end of the book is the practice just what's it look like on the ground level when the rubber meets the road what's it look like in light of that problem and that priority how do you do church and so uh we're going to see as you will find um maybe a, a how you do church that has a little bit of distance between the original setting and our situation but i'm convinced that uh, the Spirit has something for each one of us this morning, and that's what we'll look forward to. So let's go to the Lord again in prayer. Um, we pray before the sermon not because, oh, you're supposed to pray before the sermon. Why do we pray as we come to God's Word? We, we are flat out dependent on Him, uh, or else we're going to listen to some guy yap for 40 minutes or whatever, Go home and not be changed at all, but only the Spirit of God can enact change in each one of our hearts. And so that's why we always pray as we come to God's Word. So let's pray. Father, it's uh, genuinely a delight to be with your people. I, there's nowhere on earth I would rather be than right here, right now. And I ask God that... Uh, in the next few moments, we would each be transformed individually, and that as a result, collectively, our mind would be conformed to your will, that we would be uh, more eager to do your business in the world, and that our uh, priorities would be in line with yours, and that's first and foremost to bring you glory by making disciples of all nations. May it be so here among us now, by your spirit and by your grace. Name. Amen. Uh, I thank you all for uh, taking prayer and praise time in a, in a exuberant direction, because uh, as you'll see here, the introduction to the sermon is the other way. <laughs> um, this week, I was confronted over and over and over again, just reading the news and hearing hearing the events of the world uh, with, with what a heartbreaking world we live in. Uh, Monday, there was the terror attack in England, uh, 23 killed, well over 100 injured. Um, Wednesday, our, our home, Montana here, was uh, in the national news uh, as a result of a uh, reporter misbehaving and a politician losing his temper and lashing out in anger. And uh, Friday, our Natalie in my previous home, Portland, a man uh, stabbed and killed two people on a train. Um, and I, I was just overwhelmed. And of course, tomorrow we remember uh, those who gave their lives, oftentimes in very, very violent situations of conflict. And I, just beat down over and over again 
thinking about the world that we live in and the constant conflict and division and turmoil and violence. Uh, and probably throughout human history, there are few concepts, few institutions that cause as much division as what we're going to see this morning. Uh, what, what's the topic of these, uh, these two verses? Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Slavery. And uh, it's taking different shapes and forms, but it's as old as human culture, and it always causes contention and strife and disunity. And uh, so what's really fascinating in the early Roman Empire, the majority of the human population in the empire were slaves. And then this little sect called the church comes along, and people start getting saved. And it doesn't take long before masters and slaves are part of the same gospel congregation. So the question then rises for those early believers, now what? What do we do about slavery? And for us, in our uh, 21st century American sensibilities, the answer seems very obvious, doesn't it? Abolish slavery! <clears throat> But there are very, very serious, possibly unforeseen consequences of deciding the church's stance is to abolish slavery. And that includes an awful lot of bloodshed. And that includes the church's focus shifting from gospel proclamation to emancipation proclamation, right? And so what we're going to see here is is a handling of the issue of slavery that our modern sensibilities struggle with, but we're going to see just how clear of a gospel focus Paul, the early church, and we ought to have that everything else, no matter how high it is, is too low of a aim for the gospel congregation other than gospel witness. And so uh, if you're visiting here with us, inside your bulletin, there's a sermon notes page on the opposite side of the announcement page. So that'll help you tra keep track of where we're going. And the big idea is simply this. The gospel revolutionizes your priorities and relationships. The gospel revolutionizes your priorities and relationships. And we're going to see this in a pretty poignant example of slavery. And I, I'm fully... I fully believe, I have every confidence that the Lord will apply that to whatever situation you are in, even though none of us are technically slaves. So this is going to be split up in two parts, verse 1 and verse 2. <laughs> verse 1 is a radical priority. Verse 2 is a countercultural family. So we'll begin right off here in verse 1. <clears throat> Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants, regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. It's kind of warm here this morning, right? Uh, one of our first two warm Sundays of the year, so just to keep your minds engaged, I've got a pop quiz for you. It's going to test the limits of your powers of observation. So go ahead and take a look around. You're going to have to be able to count. Uh, take a look here, and I want you to tell me how many slaves you can count here in this room. Zero. Does everybody have the same count as me? <laughs> okay, zero slaves. Uh, and so, because the, the primary purpose for preaching is irrelevant. So let's just skip to uh, verse 3, okay? We are not slaves. But he has something to say to slaves here that ought to, as we work our way through this, challenge us to the very, very core what is your top priority in life? At this time, any slave throughout the history of the world, basically, there would be that yearning. Of, because they have the image of God, you're supposed to. You are given by your creator these rights, and liberty is one of them, right? 
And so they have this yearning. It is not right. It's unjust for another human being to own me. And yet, what we're going to see is for gospel slaves, an even higher priority takes root here. And this should be deeply challenging to every last one of us. Now, uh, many commentators and preachers highly emphasize the distinction between American slavery in the South and the slavery known at the time in Roman Empire. And there are, the slaves in general were treated a little bit better and there wasn't the, the race dynamic of white people owning black people. Uh, so there are certain distinctions, but remember, a slave is still a slave. Rather than regarded as a person, a slave is regarded as property. You do not have the rights that God has given to you. You are not regarded with those rights of liberty and dignity and the free activity in whatever human society you find yourself in. And they oftentimes, it, it was very common for them to, their servitude to extend even to the sexual realm. You are my property, therefore you must do this for my pleasure. Uh, they could be just simply an accusation from a master against a slave. Death. No trial, no test of uh, what, what was right, who, who the right party, who the guilty party is. Just death at the word and will of the master. So while slavery was different, they still, the key issue here was they were robbed of their dignity. And Oftentimes, to, to get a shortcut to relevance, preachers will come to this passage and they'll say, this talks about employee's relationship to an employer. But guess what I do if I decide next week, you know, these folks here at Three Lakes, uh, not really, I'm not into them. What, what can I do? I can quit and move away. None of you can stop me. And some of you might help me along. <laughs> uh, any one of us here as employees at any time can say, this isn't working out, I'm moving to Brooklyn or whatever. Uh, so it, this does not apply to the employee-employer relationship. That, that is a, uh, to miss the main central issue of what it means to be a slave. And preachers often grapple with this and they, they say, well, the New Testament doesn't, uh, doesn't explicitly condemn slavery, therefore slavery must be okay. But we, what we discover in the New Testament is much more rich than that. It's slavery is unjust. And as a Christian slave, you will suffer injustice for the sake of the gospel just like Jesus did. regarding these slaves that Paul now instructs Timothy. What, what's the command that, that this uh, chapter begins with? They're to regard their own masters as what? Worthy of all honor. And, and this is one of those really challenging new covenant commands. Uh, you, you know how the old covenant, covenant uh, in the Ten Commandments don't murder. How did Jesus up the ante on that? Do you remember? If you regard your brother with hatred, you are guilty of murder. Yeah. Same thing here. The, the maybe reasonable standard was obey the external commands of your master. What does he say here? Deep down at the seat of your emotion, have an attitude, a disposition toward your master of all honor. Here's this person who owns you, who makes you work hard and doesn't pay you what you should earn as a result. Is this a challenging command? Is it an unreasonable command? In a worldly sense, it's absolutely unreasonable. You, you can't expect for my emotions to feel these 
uh, highly regarding types of thoughts and feelings about this person who does not give me the dignity that God himself says that I have. And yet, that's the command, isn't it? Uh, do you ever feel like the commands of God are beyond your reach? Whoa, I, maybe half the time I could jump this hurdle, but God's setting up this 30-foot hurdle there. What's that supposed to remind us of? God, I can't do it. And he says, exactly. Who can do it? The spirit of the almighty God living inside you. And so this would have undoubtedly, all the slaves sitting in this congregation would have been going, regard my master with all honor, Lord, I need your help. I hate that guy. So this puts the slaves right where they should be in complete dependence on their true master. Now, we saw this uh, in Sunday school. What, what We saw what the church is supposed to be like and why the church is supposed to be like that. Whenever you are studying anywhere in the entire Bible, look for the why. In this case, we get to the reason Regard their, uh, their own masters as worthy of all honor. What's the reason? So that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Did Paul care at all about human dignity? Certainly. Read, read the book of Philemon sometimes. That this is, it's a book that is explicitly about the issue of slavery. He's writing to a slave owner Philemon on behalf of a runaway slave Onesimus and he's saying I really really want you to set him free I want you to forgive this runaway slave of his wrongs and, and regard him as a brother of course Paul cares deeply about human dignity but he cares about something higher than that doesn't he there's a higher priority what is it the reputation of God and the spread of the gospel. Imagine a society that, again, the majority of the population were slaves. Slaves start coming to know Christ as their savior, and then they all start acting up, and they are disrespectful, disobedient. Uh, they're always stirring up rebellion and violence and vengeance against their masters. Uh, what reputation in the society does the church have then? You can answer. <laughs> Not a good reputation. Christians, they're about inciting uproar and causing violence and stirring up dissension. That's what Christians are about. And so he comes and he says he knows just how difficult this command is. And so he wants the slaves to have the proper motivation. He wants them to know the reputation of God. And the spread of his gospel is at stake here. I know this is difficult. I know it's unreasonable. I know it's unjust. But for these reasons, suffer through it. And that's what he's calling us to do. <clears throat> Can you sense here how the implications for your life are a little bit bigger than be a good employee and show up on time. I want you to, to think about in your life the circumstance or the arrangement where you feel the most disrespected, the most disregarded. What, what's the situation that just flat out ain't fair? and import the truths of this verse to that situation. Uh, is it the gospel way to always demand your rights? Think about our good three buddies. Uh, the Awana kids love this story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, I picture them getting out the picket signs. 
This isn't right. This isn't right. We don't deserve the fiery furnace. They're in the wrong. Is that what they did? What did they do? With wholehearted, enthusiastic trust in the Lord, they got tossed in the fire, and they were totally fine if the logical scenario played out, which involved them toasting. Is that what happened? God delivered them, and in their faith, they honored the Lord. And it's a story that to this day, around the world, from that story, we're still talking about it. Even kids with short attention spans love the story. Why? Because they didn't insist on their rights. They, by faith, trusted themselves to God's provision. The same could be said of Daniel. The same could be said of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. And the same could be said of the Lord Jesus. Did Jesus insist on his rights? He willingly suffered injustice of every imaginable kind. <coughs> Betrayal, denial, rejection, a circus court that, that could not stand uh, in legal terms. Uh, being spit on, mocked, rejected by his creatures. And he did it all. And that gives us a bit of a picture of what he's asking you, when he says, take up my cross and follow me. So we, we look at these words to slaves and we think, whoa, um, why didn't he care about their liberty when in reality, this is the call to every believer everywhere. Take up your cross daily and follow the Savior. This is what he is expecting of you. It's like prerequisite to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so this is just a case study in the realm of slavery for what discipleship looks like for every single one of us. Do you live your Christianity like that? Following Jesus means that I say no to demanding my rights. As, as Americans, by the way, uh, we are really good at demanding our rights. We're, most of us in this room are quick to notice when liberals demand their rights. Oh, man, those snowflakes. Oh, oofta. And then uh, the moment somebody suggests some gun control legislation, no! <laughs> and we get angry and we demand our rights. Is that the way of Jesus? Probably not. The gospel revolutionizes your priorities and your relationships. It's certainly the case for these slaves, and it must be, it should be the case for each one of us. So we saw a radical priority, gospel progress, I count all else as loss. Now we're going to see a countercultural family. Verse 2. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. Um, I've mentioned this a number of times, but I... I love it how uh, the church has this humorous, lovely way of smashing a bunch of people that typically wouldn't like hanging out with one another into one room like this. Uh, and it's awkward, and it's hilarious, and sometimes it's really frustrating. Uh, and that's God's will for us, bringing people from every tribe, tongue, and nation into one group. And then he says, I'm counting on your unity for the progress of my gospel. Go for it with his empowerment, of course. Uh, can you imagine being a slave and you come to know the Lord? You, you hear the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and you come to him in faith. Uh, and then a few weeks later, your master 
comes to know the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, and he's sitting across from you in church. Do you think you might maybe wish he didn't come to know the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Was it maybe a little bit more comfortable for you before that happened? Uh, if it were me, I, I would feel that way. Man, that guy, oh, oh man. I have to be around him all week long, say yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. I'm just trying to do verse one's commands and now here he is in the church. Can anybody else be that honest? Come on, we're all like that, right? <laughs> We, we all go, at something we should go, yay, about. Uh, in Galatians, there's, uh, there's that command about what, what the church is like. Um, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so one of the questions... Uh, resonating in the minds of the folks at that time in the first century church in Ephesus would have been, okay, uh, I'm a slave and John is my master. What's our relationship look like now? Um, can, can I say to him, hey, because of the truth of the gospel, we are all equal and you, you cannot own me. Is, is that what I should say? And so he gave uh, pretty specific directions for that kind of scenario. And uh, what, what's my responsibility to John as my owner? Don't get any crazy ideas. <laughs> uh, does the obedience and submission to the master stop? No. It increases. <clears throat> They must not be disrespectful. So the, the original wording of this uh, command in verse 2 could more accurately be read. They must stop being disrespectful. So he was seeing a scenario where the slaves in this congregation were being disrespectful, were treating their masters with disdain, were using their equality with them as a source of self-indulgence. And he says, cut it out. Stop it. And again, um, if, we, if any one of us put ourselves in the sandals of a first century slave, can you understand the desire to feel and then act out in disrespect toward this person? Yeah, and, and maybe even as that other, as the master came to know Christ, you, you can almost sense your hope rising. Oh, they know, they know the truth of God now. Maybe, maybe they'll come around and have a, have a biblical understanding that we are equal and that no man should ever own another man. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And then <coughs> it doesn't happen. I, I think we can all relate to how difficult that would be. And so he says, stop being disrespectful. What's the reason? Again, whenever you see a command, what you're supposed to look for? The explanation, the reason, the motivation for following through the command. In this case, in verse 2, they must not be disrespectful. They must stop being disrespectful. Why? On the ground that they are brothers. Just like in verse 1, how the priority of the reputation of God and his gospel took first place in the minds of these uh, slaves, now the relationship of a slave, a believing slave to a believing master as brothers in the Lord, that becomes the way that they regard their connection. And how are we supposed to all, as brothers and sisters, uh, behave toward one another. Show hospitality, hospitality to one another. Pray for one another. Love one another. Prefer one another. Serve one another. Uh, there's a whole bunch of one another that I miss there. And that, even for a slave regarding his master, becomes the marching orders 
for that slate. So again, don't let yourself off the hook because you're not a slave. Think of the person in your life, the believer in your life, that you are most prone to ignore the one another's. The, the person that makes you go, I know I'm supposed to show hospitality to fellow believers, but yeah, not for you. Uh, I know I'm supposed to love and pray for fellow believers, but not that gal. <clears throat> Who's the person that tempts you to disregard what Jesus commands you to do for fellow believers? For a slave, it would almost certainly always be his master. Why? Why won't he give me my freedom? Why does he not treat me with the dignity that I should be treated with? Why doesn't he recognize my hard work through a wage? Who's that person for you? And what's your responsibility toward that person? Honor them. Serve them. Pray for them. Within this room right now, there might be relationships that are strained. There might be old <coughs> grudges. There might be uh, property disputes. There might be uh, just that angry rumor, that gossip that got spread around because of that person. And you're still pretty bent out of shape because of it. A countercultural family says, you regard them as Christ regards them, and he gave up his life for that person. He shed his blood to forgive that sin that you are holding on to. In a very real way, it is a spit in the face of the dying Savior when you cling to a sin that he has declared forgiven. When you live like this, uh, the benefits on this earth might never come. Uh, a master is unlikely to say to release a slave who serves in this way. <laughs> They're going to have every reason in the world to hold on to them and not grant them their freedom because that's my very best slave. Are we supposed to? look for approval, and acquire wealth on this earth? Is that our priority? Yeah. Heaven. And uh, I, there's stories throughout, uh, throughout church history of the dynamic being really interesting where within the church, a slave is an elder and a master is a member of the congregation. And guess what the master's responsibility to the slave is in that situation? Submit. And as, as this reputation of the church starts spreading, that, that slave is always talking well of his master. They're just working hard, and even when everybody else is conspiring and uprising, they're just doing their work without a complaint and constantly praying for their master. Guess what the reputation of the church starts to look like? Their kingdom must really be out of this world. They must genuinely believe that the treasure of heaven is worth giving up everything here, and it becomes a pretty compelling gospel case, doesn't it? And the same is with you when you embody these priorities and these kinds of relationships with one another, it becomes a very compelling gospel light for this community. And so please, I beg of you and I'm growing in this myself. We, we need to look at these commands to slaves and say, how does this apply to me? Because are, are Christians uh, called slaves anywhere? Slaves of who? <coughs> slaves of Christ. Uh, and at the very end, well done, good and faithful, most literally, 
slave. And so we owe our everything to him. Now in this context, uh, this is kind of an interesting dynamic in 1 Timothy because anywhere else it talks to the various members of a household and slaves would be part of a household. It always, in the New Testament, almost without exception, says, Husbands, this is your responsibility. Then what? Wives, this is your responsibility. Parents, this is your responsibility. Children, this is your responsibility. Slaves. We don't see commands given to masters here, do we? <clears throat> Why do you think that might be? When you're studying your Bibles, pay attention to the commands that are given and the commands that are not given. Because you learn an awful lot straight from the text about what was going on there, in, for, in this case, first century Ephesus. Who do you think needed instruction in this church? The slaves. The slaves were rising up, being disrespectful, that kind of a thing. Who do you think, it appears, had their act together? By virtue of the fact that they are not giving commands, it seems as though the masters in this scenario probably had a fairly good gospel approach to being a master. And so um, just to give us, for our situation, a little bit more of a well-rounded view of this, I'll, I'll give you some of the other writings of Paul, the responsibilities to masters, so that you know the ideal in the New Testament church isn't necessarily the abolition of slavery, but it does involve slaves and masters regarding one another according to the gospel. Right? So in Ephesians, he says to masters, masters, uh, do good or treat your slaves well uh, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. There is no partiality with God. Uh, and so <laughs> that would make quite a few masters stir in their seats, wouldn't it? Oh, how I treat my slave, I'm responsible to a greater, higher master for how I do that. Um, and then, again, please read, sometime this week, read Philemon. Um, it's, it's one chapter. It's quick. Uh, it'll take you five minutes, but this gives uh, the most at-length description of slavery in the New Testament. And I want you to see how Paul pleads to the slave owner on behalf of Onesimus, the slave, ultimately encouraging him to release his slave. This is from, uh, I'll read a few excerpts from Philemon 8 through 16, verse 8 through 16. Accordingly, though I, this is Paul speaking, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you what is required, and what is required we'll see is granting Onesimus his freedom, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus. Onesimus is the slave. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that, watch closely, your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. Verse 16, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And so he pleads with him, with Philemon, the slave owner, and he says, starting with a change of heart. I'm not demanding that you release Onesimus. I'm pleading with you for you to regard him as he is, which is as a brother in the Lord, as an equal. And you will not uh, treat him any longer as a slave, but as your brother. 
And that's what all of this, whether to slaves or to masters, ultimately comes down to, and it's what it comes down to for each one of you. It has to start in the heart with a reversal of priorities. Uh, for this master to release a slave like that, guess what hurts? The bottom line. No more free labor. Guess what benefits? The eternal bottom line. The glory of God, the reputation of the church. So just imagine slaves on a wide scale there in Ephesus, slaves living out this way, uh, that we've described today, just constantly giving honor to their masters, and masters doing the unbelievable thing of releasing their slaves, even though it hurt their bottom line, pretty soon people throughout the community start going, whoa, there's something special happening there. And so uh, even though there is the uh, cultural distance, I encourage each one of you for the rest of today uh, to just be thinking, how does this apply to me in my situation? How can I embody these principles that were given to, originally to slaves? How does that uh, make its home in my own life? The gospel revolutionizes your priorities and your relationships. That's, that's the overall challenge, isn't it? If you've come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, it should start becoming more and more obvious that your priorities are radically different than the priorities of those around you who do not know Christ. And that's the challenge for each one of us today. Let's pray. Father, I, I do thank you that uh, though we were once enslaved by the world, by our own fleshly desires, that you freed us and made us your slaves. And uh, you are the best master in the universe. You, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And it is a joy, a delight to serve you. And I ask God that uh, this congregation would inspire and encourage and pray for one another to be more joyful in our service to you. That as a community, as a congregation, we would serve in this, in this greater community of Troy in a way that, uh, that makes you look glorious, that brings, uh, brings attention to the, the power, the beauty, and the goodness of the gospel. Uh, we love you, and we thank you yet again uh, for the men and women who have served uh, and have laid down their lives in, in similar fashion to how Christ laid down his life for us. And he is who we come here to honor. May he be honored uh, now through the rest of our day. In Jesus' name.